Yes, right now you're um, involved in this uh, priesthood band where you're uh, playing the songs you, uh, the repertoire you recorded with, with Judas Priest. So when when when, rehe- when you had uh, to rehearse these songs, did you find any of them which aged particularly well? Um, <laughs> aged particularly well. They all bring back memories for me, obviously, because you know I enjoyed playing them at the time, and when we started playing them again. For a start off, I had to completely relearn all my drum parts because it's such a long time since I played those songs that uh, I had to refresh on them by listening to all the tracks again and picking out the ones that we wanted to do. I wanted to focus on four albums because I, I, I joined Priest for the Sin After Sin tour. Uh, but you hadn't recorded that? No, I didn't record it. That was Simon Phillips. Mm-hmm. But of course, Simon didn't want to do the tour. He had other commitments. So that was my first tour, and uh, the only so the only drummer to perform the, the, that material live was me. Uh, so there's some good tracks in that album. I wanted to throw some of those in because the, the fans have seen me play that stuff in the past anyway. Mm-hmm. Then of course uh, the next album which I which I recorded with them was uh, Stained Class, and uh, I had an opportunity there to co-write Beyond the Realms of Death with, with Rob. I wrote, all, I, wrote, I wrote the music and Rob came up with the lyrics and thus the title. Um, so we all, we all, again, we all, you know, it was a question of album, tour, album, tour, album, tour. So I've included a lot of material from the Stained Class album. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, the, and it's funny because there's quite a lot of the songs that we do tonight mm-hmm. from the Stained Class and that the band never played live. Yeah. You know, we never actually, I don't remember us ever playing Stained Class live, you know, the, the track Stained Class. And I think even more so Killing Machine, they rarely play, um, apart from a couple of songs from that Killing Machine, they yeah. play very few of yeah. them in the set list. Well, I think it's the same. Every time about, every time they come up with a new album, mm-hmm. they maybe play only about four or five tracks off it. And then, because the fans still want to hear some of the older stuff as well. Mm-hmm. And... Um, uh, but we're playing a lot of stuff now, obviously on the Killing Machine album, which was retitled Hellbent for Leather in America. Yeah, for the States, yeah. Uh, I think that was due to, they had some school shootings over there at, at the time. You know. Some, sorry? School shootings. Oh, yes. You know, yes. somebody went crazy with a gun at a school somewhere. Indeed, yeah. And so they thought the story, Killing, Machine, yeah. uh, K- Killing Machine title was a bit too strong for them at that point. So... Um, so they retitled it A Hell Band for Leather in the States, but it's the same album. Mm. Uh, so we're doing a lot of stuff from that album as well. And of course, the the live album, At Least in the East, we do a lot of stuff from that mm-hmm. as well. Um, you mentioned St. Class. The, the album was um, released in 1978, where the British music scene was undergoing some significant changes. So how important do you think that album was in providing the initial momentum for what would uh, eventually become known as the New Wave of British Heavy Metal? Um, I don't think we even really contemplated it that way at the time. We were just doing our own thing. Mm-hmm. And uh, we, you know, we were just writing the music that we like to play and record. And that, all, that, all that side of things didn't really enter into it, you know. That, that, was mm-hmm. a, that people, people use those analogies nowadays, you know, they're looking back. Yeah. But the whole new wave of heavy metal thing was something that was invented just a little bit later. You know, it's just starting to happen with, with bands like like uh, Iron Maiden coming out uh, coming up at that time, uh-huh. uh, and, and several other bands of that of that period. But it was also a time when punk was happening. Indeed, yeah. You know, and un- unfortunately, a lot of the record companies thought that punk was going to be the next big thing, and uh, they thought metal was a thing of the past. You know, and they rather, they couldn't uh, have been yeah. They, you know, they, they thought that's been done now. Where, where, of course, metal's never been bigger than it today. Than it's, you know, it's, it's a show. one of the most enduring. Um, yeah. But styles record of companies, music. you know, they they're a bit daft. They, 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 that's the way they were thinking in those days. That the whole mm-hmm. punk thing was was really, really uh, limited to the small club scene. And in America, they wanted stadium rock, and they wanted big bands that could fill stadiums. Indeed. Let's just um, go back in time, you know, talk about the other uh, musical involvements you've done. Um, sometime around uh, 74, you were playing with um, Roger Glover, basis of Deep Purple. Right, what yeah. do you remember of that 
period of your life? I'd been working in a band called Fancy, and we had uh, some record success in the States. And uh, we toured America, did some TV shows over there. We did a week at the Whiskey Gogo go in LA. The famous yeah. Whiskey Gogo. go And a funny story about that, because right at the end of the week, we finished up on a Friday night, and we, were, we had the next day off, Saturday, and we were flying out very early, first thing on Sunday, to another part of the States to do another gig. And right at the end of the night, that was our last show at the Whiskey, Mm -hmm. And a guy walked up to me, and he had a full beard, and he was wearing a beige suit with a matching beige uh, waistcoat mm -hmm. and a kipper tie. And as he got closer, I recognized him. It was Keith Moon. Oh, wow. Yeah, because he was living in L.A. at that time. In fact, you also recorded with, with um, Pete Townsend, I believe, no? With who, sorry? Pete Townsend. Um, uh, with Pete Townsend? That's right, yeah, yeah. Yes. So, anyway, sorry. Yeah, yeah, anyway, so that's another story. But, um, so he came up to me, and, he, and I had, like everyone else, you have this impression, you know, if you've never met the guy, that he's, uh, Moon, Moon the Loon was his... Was his you know, Famously, no, yeah, yeah, so uh, anyway, he came up, and he, he seemed to be completely straight. Mm -hmm. He wasn't intoxicated or anything like that. And he was a real gentleman, really polite. He shook hands with me, he said, I really like your playing. Okay. And he said, and he said um, we're, I'm making a solo album at the moment at the record plant in, a, in L.A. And he said, it's very, very loose. I'm just inviting friends down and mm -hmm. jamming to see what comes out of it. Mm -hmm. And he said, would you like to bring your guy, come down and bring the guys in the band with wow. you? You know, okay. and maybe see, see what comes out of it, you know. So I said, yeah, sure. You know, but I couldn't understand why he was asking me because I'm a drummer, he's a drummer. And it's his album, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but I yeah. was flattered anyway, you know. So, of course. Uh, unfortunately, uh, he gave me. A, he took a little folder of matches out of his pocket, you know, mm -hmm. the type you get in a hotel, complimentary ones. Yeah. But it was from the record plant, the studio. Yeah. And it had their f telephone number and their address and stuff on it. So he gave me that. And he said, "Give us a call tomorrow around midday. I'll be at the studio." So I phoned up from the hotel. And I got some American guy onto the phone. I said, is Mr. Moon there? He said, oh, he's just popped out for a few minutes. Uh, can you call back later or something like that? As it happened, there just wasn't enough time for us to organize anything because we, oh, were, flying out. we were flying out first thing the following morning. So no, it didn't happen, you know, but it was an interesting experience. Yeah, yeah. indeed. Um, did, uh, there was a... Oh, sorry, I was just going to ask about Roger. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, we, we came back and we toured the UK mm -hmm. uh, with uh, 10CC. Okay. And Roger had seen the band somewhere along the way, and he knew the guitar player, Ray Fennick. Uh, and he liked the band, so he asked us to, to play on his solo album, which was the Butterfly Ball album. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we were the rhythm section for that. And there was also Ronnie James Dio guesting on one song. Were you ever at, in the studio with, with Dio at one yeah, point? Yeah, you yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I think what happened was Dio, because we did a concert afterwards at the Royal Albert Hall. Okay. And we had all kinds of guest singers on, a lot of people that were involved in the album. Mm -hmm. We had uh, David Coverdell, Ian Gillen. Uh, Ronnie, Ronnie James Dio. Mm -hmm. uh, we had lo loads of people uh, involved in that. Uh, and we also had um, the privilege of having Vincent Price, the actor. Okay, know. the horror film. Yeah, yeah. He, and that was before he did the uh, thriller, thriller thing with Michael Jackson. You know. Oh, yes, that was he, him who yeah, did yeah. those. Yes, of course. But uh, he was in the Royal Box with a spotlight on him because all the songs represented characters in a book. Okay. Yeah, so he introduced each song. Okay. Uh, he introduced the characters from the book and read some of the lines from the book. And we had Twiggy as well. She sang one of the songs on it. On it. Mm -hmm. we, had a, we had a whole orchestra and a choir. It was an amazing event. Unfortunately, Ronnie couldn't do the... the uh, he, he, he did the studio sessions, okay. Mm -hmm. And he was rehearsing with us for the, for the show at, at the Royal Albert Hall. Mm -hmm. But... He he, he he was offered the gig with uh, Rainbow. Of course, so that he, was the time he yeah, started. So he had to fly to America to rehearse and work with, with them. So he never. So we got Ian Gillen come in at the last minute and did, and did his part. 
Okay, and then um, of course you you um, you also did an, um, two albums for a band called Access Point, a prog, prog band. Oh, that's right. Um, why do you think that band didn't flourish beyond two albums? Uh, well, it was kind of um, because a lot of the people involved in that were also involved in the Butterfly Ball. Eddie Harden okay. was Eddie Harden on keyboard. He played he played on the Butterfly Ball album as well. Okay. We had Charlie McCracken from Taste with Rory Gallagher. Uh, on bass, uh-huh. Charlie Whitney from Family uh, on guitar. And who else? And who else was on it? So, well, we did a couple of albums, mm-hmm. uh, and we know I don't think we ever done any live shows. Though. No, we haven't yeah. done any live show, did you? Uh, I think everyone was because everyone was was working in sessions and working in studios mm-hmm. all the time, and there were so many projects going on that. Yeah. You know, it, it, everyone went off on separate ways and did separate projects. Okay, so it just fizzled out. Fizzled out into yeah. nothing, exactly. Which this brings us to um, to Judas Priest. Um, my impression is that your, um, although the fans recognized you, of course, as their drummer and you provided your creative input with the band, your your status was that of a session drummer, I believe. Is that right or? or um, didn't you didn't you try to change that or were you happy with that situation? Well, it's an important factor because it led to your resignation with the band. Yeah, well, both myself and Simon, who worked with them previously, uh-huh. okay. were both session drummers. You know. How but, come? Well, why was that? Well, because we kind of enjoyed working with different artists all the time. You know. Uh, like Jose Powell, you enjoyed the flexibility of yeah, working with yeah. many musicians. And uh, uh, I mean. I think Simon was offered the gig, but he had other plans, you know. Uh-huh. So at that time, it's different today, very different today, because the whole record industry has changed unrecognizably. Mm-hmm. And the session scene is not as lucrative as it used to be. Absolutely, you know? yeah. But back then, there was a lot of work around, and it's before computers and all the techno stuff that's come out since, you know, which uh, has affected uh, musicians, you know, like me. Yeah. Um, on to, uh, about Judas Priest, um, my understanding is that um, you felt a bit bitter uh, with your ex bandmates of Judas Priest for um, perceived lack of support uh, about that feud you had with the band management. I wanted to ask you did you ever talk to the band, uh, your ex bandmates, uh, after that uh, event and, and talk that? No. Uh, that period out with them? Well, there was a number of things. Uh, there was a sort of entourage mm-hmm. of people that were ha- that came with the management side of things mm-hmm. that were a part of the entourage that came with us on tour. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I found some of them quite obnoxious, you know. We came back from a very long tour. And we'd done it. We, we finished off with a British tour. Mm-hmm. and finished up with two nights at Hammersmith Odeon. Total sellout tour, and uh, things were things were on the up. The band was getting bigger and bigger all the time. And, uh, things were going up, and uh, you know, I always negotiated uh, fees for recording because I wasn't signed to CBS. Yeah, and the only way—that's the only way I was going to make make get paid for anything. And so I would always negotiate that before going into a studio with the band. On this occasion, on this occasion, uh, it was a live situation, and uh, yeah, we, we just turned became up. Became yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But I wasn't informed in advance that we were going to record any of the shows to be released as an album. That was never indicated to me at all. So when the subject came up, uh, it was sort of. Trivialized. So, I oh, don't worry about it. It's, it's just for CBS, Sony, say, blah, blah, blah. So then when we took a break after that tour, I was hoping that the band was going to go into the studio and, and, and make, make a fresh album. Mm-hmm. And it would have given me an opportunity to write some more material and uh, contribute to the writing as well, which I was interested in doing. But the management called me into the office and said that the guys are all down at startling studios in Ascot, that's Ringo Starr's studio. Yeah. And uh, they said they're listening to the uh, live recordings from Japan and it sounds really good. Um, 
we think this is going to be the next album. Well, that meant there's no, we're going to go out on tour again to promote yeah. the material, the same material we've been playing for months, you know. Of course. Yeah, yeah. with no fresh stuff. And uh, so that I was disappointed that we weren't going to do an, a new studio album of fresh material. And so I said, well, that's okay. Just pay me the same fee that you paid me for the last album. And we said, oh, well, you see, there's... We think it would be a nice gesture on your behalf if you were to waive your fees on this occasion. You know? So I, you know, that's when the shit hit the fan. You know. Yeah. And I saw these. You know, this is ridiculous. You know, how am I supposed to live on fresh air? You know. Of course. And uh, uh, you know, and of course that album actually went platinum. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, that started a long standoff between me and the management and. It got quite nasty in the end, you know. Uh, my drums were being held ransom. I couldn't get my drums back from the, the tour that we just finished because it was all being held. Your actual kit to me? Hmm? The tracks or your drum kit to me? Yeah, yeah. It was being held at the um, at, at the uh, lighting company who'd, who'd done the, t the tour because we just finished the tour in Britain. Yeah. And uh, I went up to... I, hired, I hired, got, got a van, hired, went up to collect the kit from, the, from their premises. And I was told, well, oh, we've had a call from my management saying not to let you take any equipment off the premises. You know? Now, my kit was being used for a photo session for the live album. You see that picture that's on the uh, cover? That's a staged photograph. That's staged. Yeah, it's, it, not actually... it's, not, it's not actually a live performance. And that's my kit in the background. So they were using my kit okay. for the photo session and, and uh, so they didn't want me to have it back, you know, we, so we were using it for a photo session, but so you can see Rob's, he's standing in front of the kit, so you can't see there's no drummer. Indeed, the head's you know. covering the yeah. drummer. Yeah, so, you know, things got quite nasty, and so I just thought, well, if that's the way they want to treat me, there's no point in me hanging around anymore, you know, I, I might as well move on, you know, back, I've got all my studio work, because I was the only guy in the band mm -hmm. who was musically active outside of the band, because I put all my session contacts on hold while I was away on tour, and um, the um, the uh, opportunity would, would arise. Opportunity would arise when I when the band took a break. Yeah. I, would, I would just phone up all my contacts and get back in the studio and work with different people. Yeah, and um, did you ever talk to the band members of Judas Priest about this story? Um, much, much later, you ever well, discussed it? Don't forget, in those days, nowadays everyone's got a mobile smartphone. Yeah. You know, got an iPhone or whatever. Yeah. In those days, they didn't. Okay. So you had to, you had to resort to a landline. It might have been different if there yeah. was. Well, I don't know, but I would. Have, but at the time, they, they were, they weren't at home. They were at the studio. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't understand why I wasn't invited down to the studio to hear the material as well, you know. Yeah. And uh, and I thought, well, nobody bothered to phone me and say, our managers told me you're leaving. Is, is something upset you? What's the problem? Yeah. Look, can we can't we sort this out because we don't want to lose you? Yeah. No, but that never happened. Nobody phoned me, and I thought, okay, if that's the way you want it, and I, I never I never bothered to try and contact anyone either, you know. And it's only recently that I reunited with K.K. Downey. Okay, what did he say? Well, he was delighted to see me, you know. Okay. And we spent a really really pleasant evening together in, the, in his lo local pub, you know, having a few pints of uh, Guinness, you know. <laughs> and uh, he was really... We, we had some very interesting conversations, you know. Um, I recently came across an interview with uh, Metallica drummer Lars Ulrich where he says that beyond the realms of death, which of course he composed, uh, and also the Purple's Child and Time, were uh, blueprints for classic Metallica songs such as Fade to Black, Welcome Home, Sanitarium and One. Does it surprise you that your output with Judas Priest continues to influence generation after another? Yeah, it does, and especially through since the advent of the internet, social media and all that stuff. You know, I've got a lot of messages come through from people all over the world, you know, that have said, oh, you're the reason why I, I, I took up playing drums, you know, because I got this album that you played on, you know, and that really inspired me to pick up a pair of sticks and, and uh, got me into playing in the first place, you know. So that's quite, um, 
quite quite nice to know that uh, uh, you've had some positive influence on people. After Jesus Priest, you also joined Titan, and one of the main differences with Jesus Priest was, of course, Titan had just one guitar and uh, one keyboards. How, how did you feel about that um, change in format? There weren't those twin guitars. The, they actually had two guitar players. They did. Yeah, yeah. Um, and oh shit, I can't remember the other guy's name actually. But um, the, one of them is Steve Mann, who I'd known for uh -huh. quite some time. He now works with Michael Shanker, and, okay. and also he's he, he still works with um, Lionheart, which, which are another, active again now. Yeah, that's another band that I got involved with as well. Uh -huh. But I did their album at Ramport Studios, uh, which is actually where uh, the Sin After Sin album was recorded, because that that's, that was the the Who studio that belonged to the Who. Uh, we recorded the Titan album there, and again, my involvement with the band was purely on a session basis. Again, you know, mm -hmm. uh, because there were still sorting out management problems and. With Titan, yeah, 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 yeah. And but the album wasn't even released after before they split up. No, no. And I did an album around the same time for Roger Chapman, uh, and um, it's called Mail Order Magic. And I think Mitch Mitchell played on at least one of, one of the tracks on it. Jimi Hendrix, as well. yeah, yeah, as okay. well. Okay. Uh, um, sorry, we were saying so. Uh, yeah, and I was I was travel, traveling about all over the place. I mean, I did an album in in uh, Italy, in a medieval castle, which, um, just outside of Milan, okay. a place called Caramata, and uh, that was that was for a guy called Eugenio Fanardi. He was uh, a uh, big 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 star in in, in Italy, you know. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, Lionheart, which um, also had Dennis Stratton, of course, yes, the Simon Maiden guitarist with the band. Um, what, um, what, what had led to your departure from that band? Because th they didn't release an album until recently. It was just some demos you yeah. recorded, they recorded, no? But again, the band was just starting off. Mm -hmm. And there were, there's always a few teething problems, you know, when a band's starting out. Mm -hmm. uh, the management they had, I, I felt, was let them down, you know. Um, and I think they were trying to secure a record deal for the band at that time. Uh, when I when I worked with them, they they hadn't recorded anything yet. They hadn't the material they were working. They had material together, and we did a tour with Te with uh, Def Leppard, and uh, who was the other band on that? Uh, Saxon. Okay. So, so Lionheart, Saxon, and Def Leppard. Def Leppard, yeah. And this was before the, their drummer had the accident with his arm, you know. So he had both arms at that time. Uh -huh. um, what do you think then, about about him when he kept playing with just one arm? Oh, as, was, a, as a drummer, well, it's a tragic thing to happen, especially to a drummer or anybody for that matter. Uh -huh. um, but I, I, I think it was great the way the band supported him. You know, that is a crucial. Factor, yeah, yeah, and he adopted electronic equipment to help him get round that. You know, compensate for yeah them. yeah it did change their sound because a lot of the sounds are samples you know are you still in touch with uh, Lionheart and Titan yeah in fact I bumped into Dennis recently back okay. in back in March he was at uh, Legends of Rock thing up in uh, uh, Great Yarmouth uh, I, I, came, I was there in 2016 yeah he came up and said hello to me yeah it was nice to see him after all this time you know Rory Gallagher Rory Gallagher sorry. yeah 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 um what was that like? Because I don't think that those recordings were ever released, right? No, it was all a bit weird. What happened was I, I'd, I'd done a tour with Rory before. Mm -hmm. I was in a band called the Joe O'Donnell Band, which was a guy who played electric violin. Uh, and it was all instrumental stuff. Okay. So and he was, uh, he was an Irish guy. And we were managed by Donald Gallagher, which was Rory's brother. His bro Rory's brother always managed him when he went and became a solo mm -hmm. artist. So his brother always took care of business. And I got a phone call from... Uh, we had I had done a tour with Rory with the Joe O'Donnell band. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I sort of got to know him slightly. He got to see me play with the, with the Joe O'Donnell band. And uh, after, just shortly after I left Priest, I got a phone call from Donald Gallagher. 
and he said, Rory's uh, looking for a, a drummer at the moment, would you be interested? And I said, sure. So uh, I went along, met up with him, and it was just him and his bass player, Jerry McAvoy. And we, I, I discovered that Rory had just made an album in America, uh, uh, funny enough, the record plant in Los Angeles. And they had a top uh, producer working with them, the guy who used to produce the band, uh, Bob Dylan's backing band. Mm -hmm. And uh, he brought the album, the finished album, back to the UK. He was signed to Chrysalis Records at the time. Played it to them and they said no, then rejected it. So that okay. was quite a big blow to his ego and his confidence, I think, to have a whole album. What it's, was the music like? Because since we cannot hear it, we're relying on your description. Well, well I'll, I'll explain. So um, I think at that point in time, Rory's head was all over the place because it was unheard of to, for him to make an album and, 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 and the record company say, no, we're not going to put it out. You know, reject it. So anyway, we, I started rehearsing with him and there was just the three of us, guitar, bass, drums. And he was trying to rework the same material. He, he hadn't written anything new. Uh, so we were trying to put a different spin on it. And we went into Air London Studios in Regent Street, which was uh, the Beatles producer, George Martin's studio. Okay. Fantastic studio. And the, there was no producer. You know, no producer at all. Rory always had a problem with producers. Uh, he always wanted to do things his own way. He wouldn't listen to what producers suggested to him. And um, so he went in the studio with no producer, just an engineer. And it happened that the engineer was a drummer as well. Mm -hmm. So we worked together, got a really good drum sound together. And the bass player was DI'd in the, in the control room. Rory was had picked up this, this old retro uh, amplifier, it was, I, think, I think it was an old Fender valve amplifier that he found somewhere in, in America. Uh, vintage thing. But it was very noisy and it was making a lot of a lot of background noise and it was giving the engineer a lot of problems. So he was screened off in one end of the room and I was, I was at the other. And the bass player was in the, in the uh, control room, DI'd. And I couldn't believe it. Rory was, he had a microphone in uh, with him in, in the area that was screened off with his amplifier. So he was singing live, playing live, and doing the solos live. And um, we did a couple of takes of a song called Brute Force and Ignorance. Brute Force of Ignorance. Brute Force and Ignorance, and ignorance. yeah. And uh, we came back and had a listen to the takes. And Rory wasn't happy. There were still problems with his equipment. And... So I said, well, let's, let, let's, not, let's not get bogged down in this. Let's, let's move on to one of the other songs and we'll come back to this one. So we moved on eventually to another song, can't remember which one. And virtually the same thing happened again. And then I said to him, look, Rory, why don't we just concentrate on getting a really good bass and drum track down? You know, and then you can overdub your guitar solos and do your vocals separately, you know, do two or three takes, pick the best one pick the best guitar solo and uh, use the studio mm -hmm. you know, we're not playing to a live audience so let's take advantage of the 24 track studio mm -hmm. so all of a sudden I was sounding like a producer you know he'd heard this a thousand times from other other producers and people because mm -hmm. that's the way people were used to working in the studio yeah so um, anyway we we, tr we trunched you know we carried on for a while and then we, we quit for the day and the next day, I got a phone call from Donald saying Rory wanted to call it quits, you know, whatever for whatever reason, you know. And I read later in a book that um, the bass player has written, Jerry McAvoy, mm -hmm. about his time with Rory, and he mentions that period, you know. Yeah. And um, uh, you know, I think we had different we had different ways of working in the studio. So he still wasn't happy with the sound. Uh, he wasn't happy, period. Okay. Because he's had an album rejected, his confidence was 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 all over the okay. place. You know, his his ego was dented, mm -hmm. uh, and I don't know where his head was. You know. Okay. So that affected everybody. Last question. Um, we 
you've worked with a lot of musicians over the years, but you've never actually um, released an album with your own material. Yeah. So is a solo album something you would like to consider in, in the near future? It's, it's, I, I never say never. Uh, it's possible. But um, I'm, I would have to get my head into writing and getting a lot of stuff together. And uh, yeah, you never know. Just watch this space, you know, something. I mean, from all the musicians you've worked, I'm sure you'll find. Oh, of course, yeah. People who are willing to. Oh, definitely, yeah. Oh, I've got plenty of, plenty of great musicians that I could work with, yeah. It's just a matter of the. Because I'm not signed to a record uh-huh. company at the moment, so uh, it's very it's easier to motivate yourself when you have a, an outlet. You mm-hmm. know, when I was in Priest. The band was signed. We had publishing, all that kind of stuff. So you had an incentive. So you had the incentive because you knew you were going to make the next album. Yeah. So you could get down to writing, and you knew there was going to be a product at the end of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, now you have to go into the studio, pay for your own studio time, pay the musicians, mm-hmm. and then try and find a record company who wants to put it out. You know, really, most people are doing it doing it themselves these days. And now with the internet, and, yeah. You know, YouTube technology is more accessible yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Les Binks it's been a pleasure and an honor speaking to you